Today we're at chapter 10, where Saul is anointed the first king of Israel. And this, this chapter continues the story that began in chapter 8 with Israel's request for a king, and then continued in chapter 9 with the choosing of Saul. And then chapter 10 divides clearly into two parts, and we'll cover part one this morning. Saul is anointed and given signs of his calling in verse one, verses 1 through 16. And at that point, like we're going to see this morning, Samuel and Saul, and of course God, of course, are the only ones who are aware of this anointing. And then, uh, and then Saul, in verses 17 to 27, Saul is proclaimed to be the king before the people. And uh, the latter section, as we'll discover next week, is, is, seems almost like an extension of chapter 8, with Samuel again uh, expressing his feelings about the behavior during the monarchy, the behavior of the kings. And so the setting for verse 1 reaches back into chapter 9 for its uh, context. As you recall from last week, Saul had spent the night with Samuel after having been the guest of honor at a sacrificial feast. Saul's daddy, Kish, had lost some uh, animals, some donkeys. And he sent Saul and a servant out to look for him and says, you need to come back with them. And so in the process of going out and looking for those, Saul gets interrupted. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So God had spoken to Samuel and said, you're going to see a fella that comes down the road and he's going to be head and shoulders above everybody else, very handsome, and he says, I've chosen him to be, at this point, king over Israel. So Samuel gets advance notice about that. So, and Saul knows nothing about that. And so he sees he sees Saul coming, and then he invites him to his house and has his guest of honor. And then early the next morning, Samuel wakes Saul up. He walks to the outskirts of the city with him. And then after sending Saul's servant on ahead, Samuel says this to Saul. And this is in verse uh, 27 of chapter 9. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on. But I want you to stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. And so it's probably at that time then, uh, the servant goes on ahead, and then Samuel rehearses to Saul probably what went on in his heart and mind as God spoke to him about Saul. And so notice uh, verse 1 of chapter 10. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, this was olive oil, and poured it on his head, kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his her inheritance? Now, there were a couple kinds of anointings in the, in the bib biblical period. Um, first of all, there was a, a ceremonial anointing involving the pouring of olive oil on the head or body of the person to be honored. This was done a lot. And then in the case of Saul, there was an official no anointing. Uh, it involved the same process, but it signified a consecration or a setting apart of a person for religious service. That's what consecrate means to set apart. And so uh, this was a situation 
was Saul. Now the kiss here was a sign of paying homage. That's what you did to, to someone of, of royalty or going to be selected as royalty. Now, and from that moment on, Saul was leader over God's people. But like I mentioned a few moments ago, only Samuel and Saul knew that at that point, and, and God, of course. Now, take, I want you to take special note uh, of the fact that Samuel tells Saul that God is anointing him commander over his or God's inheritance. The land of Israel and the people of Israel belonged to God. They were God's inheritance. The people of Israel going all the way back to the time of Abraham. Remember God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and, and sent him. Abraham went into the promised land. Remember that. Abraham went into the promised land long before the people did. But God took him in there and, uh, and showed him stuff and everything like that. And so God was not only owner of the land, it was not only in his inheritance, the land of Canaan, but his people, he owned his people, he called them. Uh, by way of application, I want you to notice this. Both we as believers and the church as the body of Christ are God's inheritance. He owns it. You got that? And 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this, talking about the individual believer. For you were bought at a price, therefore glory God in your body, glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. So God owns it. I've, you've heard me say to you that, that uh, when I run up against stuff, when I run up against the problem, I've learned, it took me a long time to learn this, but I've learned to just simply say, God, I'm your problem. This is your problem, not mine. Lay it out before him. Say, God, you got another problem. Nehemiah, remember, in the book of Nehemiah, when God calls him, lays a burden on his heart to go back and rebuild the city, I think Nehemiah just spread everything out before the Lord. said, Lord, this is your problem. And that's what we need to do. It's hard to do that. It's hard to do that. I've had a difficult time over the last few weeks because the house that we're now living in is being sold. So we're having to relocate. And we pursued all kinds of stuff. There was all kinds of stuff going over and over in our mind. And finally, I had to come to the point and say, this, God, this is your problem. I was saying that every day, but I wasn't applying it see and so this week I just applied it and and we went and looked at a place there in Fortuna and we thought okay this needs a little bit of fixing up the people are going to do that so I told Doug because he'd referred it to us I said tell the people we're in so Doug told him that but we we were still waiting on the on the lady who who was managing everything there to get a hold of us, and she didn't. Well, in the meantime, our landlord, our current landlord, called us, sent me a text, said, I don't know what, where you are now, but I have a friend of a friend who has a house. It's six blocks from where we're living now. So we went over and took a look at it, fell in love with the place, and signed stuff, and so <coughs> we're in the process of packing up, which we really don't like to do. <coughs> we thought the place that we're in right now would be our last stop in this life, but <coughs> God had other plans. So God owns us. <coughs> we're his problem. The stuff that we go through, they're his problem. And he loves to, to take on our problem. He loves to take on us, okay? Come unto me, he said. That's a command. Come unto me, 
all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and, and I'll give you what? Rest. I'll give you rest. Mm. In Acts 20, 28, talking about the church, Paul is addressing the, the elders at, is at Ephesus in a very tearful uh, going away thing that he had with them, and he says, therefore, he's speaking to the elders, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So God bought us by the blood of Christ individually and also the church. So he wants us to, to take care of his inheritance. To take care of his inheritance. And Pastor and I take our ministry as pastors here very, very, very seriously. Very seriously. That's not done in a lot of churches. It's not. We get so sidetracked. We get so sidetracked. A couple of the guys came to me this week, a couple of guys at the mission, and says, we want to change churches. I says, why do you want to change? He says, there's too much extra stuff that goes on, and they don't spend enough time in the It takes a lot of Christians in churches a lifetime to realize that. Sometimes they never do. But here are guys, the two guys that came to, have a collective um, entrance into the kingdom of God of about four months or less. So they're grasping that. They've, they're come and they're around the word of God every day, and that's what they want. They want church to be an extension of what they got at the mission where they have and they said, sure, don't mind the singing and everything like that. But one of the fellows, Brandon, says, I, I, I don't want 35 minutes of singing and everything like that in 10 minutes of the word. See? Evangelical denominations, but still different congregations a lot. That until somebody has been in a congregation where there's where that is the emphasis, you don't know what you don't know. Right. You know, and then once a person has a taste of that, it's like, oh, this is this is how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion, and that's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we have and, and you gotta you gotta have a balance. But the biggest part of the balance has to be in 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 sharing the word. In sharing the word. Okay. Now back to our text here in First Samuel. So if only Samuel and Saul knew about this anointing incident, how could Saul then Saul was a young man at this point. How could he be sure that God had really chosen him? Had really chosen him. Well, Samuel gives Saul three signs. That is, three special occurrences that Saul would encounter as he makes his way back home. Okay? First, he would meet two men. Uh, that would tell him that the lost donkeys to belonging to his father had been found. Notice verse 2 of chapter 10. Uh, when you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Mm. This perhaps, in a nutshell, would serve as a testimony to Saul that God could solve his problem. What was the problem? Lost donkeys 
lost donkeys. But you see, or, and I say that it could serve as a, as a testimony to Saul that God could solve his problem because one of Saul's greatest failures, and we're going to see this as we go through this, as a leader was his inability to take his hands off of situations and let God work. And sometimes we're no different than Saul. We're no different than Saul. We want to we wanna help God. God, let me help you here. You're not moving fast enough. Okay? And in modern language, Saul was a kind of a control freak. He just wanted to control stuff. He didn't listen. He wasn't obedient. Okay? And what we need to realize here that while th this was I, I just wonder initially what Saul thought about this encounter with Samuel when Samuel first met him on, on the road there Saul's thinking I don't have time for this I gotta, I gotta be looking for these donkeys but see God had other plans for Saul and like the pastor shared, Saul's direction was from point, in his mind, was from point A to point B. From point A was at home with his father to point B was finding the animals. But along the way, he, he, he meets up with Samuel. And Samuel invites him to his house. And the interesting thing, while Saul and his servant, and don't miss this, when Saul and his servant were dining with Samuel, God was out work finding the donkey. See? And some of the, some, while I'm worrying about, you know, where am I going to live? Where, where are me and Nance going to live next? God is out there finding us a spot. See? And we just need to realize that. That, that God God is at work. There's so much work that God does behind the scene that we don't know about. That we don't know about. And we just got to, oh, if there's anything we can get across this morning, is just to rest in Him. Cast our care on Him and, and rest for Him. Casting all your care on Him because He cares for you. In the New Testament, two main words for cast. One means, one is in, in, in uh, when Jesus meets the disciples on the water and he says, uh, he calls to them from the shore actually and he says, have you caught any fish? They'd fished all night. They shouldn't have been out there fishing anyway. Peter decided he wanted to go fishing because he got a little weary in the things of the Lord and he took six others with him and went out there fishing. They didn't catch anything. Jesus said, have you caught any fish? Said, no. He said, well, cast the net on the other side of the boat. And that was contrary to the way, the, the way they were doing. But, but they did it. And, and they pulled in so much fish that what happened? They, were, they, they had to latch onto another boat to help them take all the fish ashore. See? And so the word cast your net, the word cast there means to cast it, cast out, and bring it back. And you come over into the letters of Paul where Paul says, cast all your care on him for he cares for you. The word for cast there, by definition, means to throw it out and don't bring it back. See? And a lot of times that's what we want to do. God, I got this problem. So we cast that, our care on the Lord and then a few few hours later, sometimes minutes, sometimes seconds later, we bring it back. You know, God, you're not working fast enough. I cast this on you, but I gotta help you. Carol? I remember that particular lesson of yours because it was one that I'd never thought of the word cast as having those two very different meanings before. And that's for me, and it's not a matter of it's you're not working fast enough or whatever. It's just it seems to be beyond my ability, and that is probably the single hardest thing in the Christian walk for me, yeah. is that 
the cast that doesn't have the reel it back in attached. A lot of times when I see what God's, it's evident that God somehow is working. And so I cast the stuff on him and I get so excited to see what God's going to do that, that I want to tell him how to do it. I'm thinking right away, well, this is probably what's going to happen. So if I go a few hours and, and it doesn't happen that way, I want to you know, go before the Lord and say, Lord, I need to help you out. Here's what you need to do. And the scripture says, just l- let him do it. Let him do it. So while Samuel and his servant were sitting down and having this nice meal, in their honor, in Saul's honor, God's out finding a donkey. Okay? The second sign would take place at an oak tree at a place called Tabor. And there he would meet three men. Saul would meet three men on their way to worship at Bethel. And now there was probably, I'm going to speculate here, there was probably a a sacred place at Bethel which was dedicated to the Lord. And perhaps the three young goats, the three loaves of bread and the wine were gifts for the Levite priests who were serving there. So these three men would greet Saul, give him two of their three loaves of bread, and Saul was to receive receive them from them. Okay, notice verses 3 and 4 of chapter 10. Then you shall go. Uh, after you, you come across these, these people that say that the donkeys have been found, then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebah tree, which is an oak tree, of Tabor, their three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One will be carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. Now, this sign, in a nutshell, this sign should serve as a testimony to Saul that God would supply his needs. And you fast forward way ahead now. You come over in the New Testament and and what what does Paul say to us? My God shall supply all your needs because Jesus is rich. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in or through Christ Jesus. Mm. Mm. God's got a lot of wealth. God's got a lot of wealth. And we 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 just need to 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 wait on wait on him. Wait on him. And 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 let him show us what he can do. You know, I, I considered even you know, last week at this time or before that of just buying a house. And the more I thought about that, I thought, gosh, I'm 75 years old. What do I, what am I do buying a house? Okay, pass it on to my kids, but still got to pay for it till then. And so God wants to show us that he can supply our needs in his time in his time. Because you see, Saul, as the first king of Israel, would have to raise up an army and and provide the food and equipment that the men needed. So he would have to depend on God to supply those needs. Okay? To supply those needs. Um, So, he goes... And he gets that. He he does just what he he was supposed to do, which was unusual for Saul on down the line. Now, the third sign had to do with spiritual power. Saul would meet a band of prophets returning from worship 
at the high place or at this sacred place, and they would be prophesying. The Holy Spirit would then come upon Saul at that time, and he would join the company of prophets in their worship, in their, for lack of a better term, ecstatic worship. Okay. Notice verses 5 and 6 of chapter 10. After that, after the, the two loaves and or the, the, the goats, the, the two loaves of bread and, and the wine, said, so after that you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there to, that, to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. See how specific this is? It wasn't just... There, well, it's believed that there was probably a school of the prophets in this area where people were trained in, in the Word of God and to, and to, and to know what was going to take place down, down the line, and then they would, they would share that with the people. And, and so, rather than that him saying you're going to meet a whole bunch of prophets, God gets specific and he says the prophets that you're going to meet, they're, they're going to have a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them and they will be prophesying. We need to pay attention to God's specifics. God's specifics. And when God ministers to us specifically, we need to look for that. And anything else that's contrary to that, we need to ignore. Dr. Martin DeHaan, M.R. DeHaan, who, who founded in the Lord, founded the radio Bible class from which we have our daily bread. Martin DeHaan went to be with the Lord a lot of years ago. But it, one, he, he was visiting in a church one Sunday morning and and it was in the Midwest, and it was he, he was from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and so he was at a church, and boy, it was cold. Boy, it was cold. And this fella comes up to him after the evening service, and he says, Dr. DeHaan, you mentioned this morning how cold it was and how cold you were. He says, well, God has impressed me to give you a coat to take care of that. And he reached in a big bag and he handed Dr. DeHaan this coat, beautiful coat. Dr. DeHaan put it under his arm and was about ready to walk out of the building and the guy says, aren't you going to try it on? Dr. DeHaan says, did God impress you to give it to me? And the fellow said, yes. What do you think Dr. DeHaan said? It'll fit. It'll fit. If God specifically told you to give it to me, then it's going to fit. See? What's that? What did you say, Ruth? Yeah, see? And so when God speaks to us specifically, that's what we need to go with. See? And, and remember, remember, uh, the, one of the rules of a prophet, what did they say about a prophet? If, if someone comes along and prophesies and it does not come to pass exactly the way the prophet said, he's what? He's a false prophet. See? And so here's, here's something. Saul needed to pay attention. He needed to pay attention. Okay? And because God's power was going to be exhibited here, and these prophets who were going to show up in, in Saul's pre presence with, with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp. See? And, and, uh, and they would be prophesying. So, and then he says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now, be turned into another man. Be cautious here. Be careful here. Don't read New Testament regeneration or salvation into this. You agree? 
it refers primarily to a different attitude and outlook. Okay? This young farmer, namely Saul, would now think and act like a leader. Wouldn't always be that way. But he'd think and act like a leader, the king of the nation, a warrior statesman whose responsibility it was to listen to God and to obey his will. The Holy Spirit would further, I, I put this down as I thought about, the Holy Spirit would further enable him to serve God as long as he walked in obedience to God's will. And then, because you see down the road, Saul became proud and independent, rebelled against God. He lost the Spirit's power. The anointing left him. He lost his kingdom to David, and he eventually lost his life. Okay? So in this third sign, it should serve as a testimony to Saul that God would provide him with the power he needed to serve as a godly king. And in talking or, or uh, listening to different preachers down through, the, down through the years as they've talked about their calling in the Lord, God seemed to, to display um, leading in much the same way, showing them that God can meet their need, showing them that, that God meant what he said, and showing them that they, the, the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God rested on them. Yeah, and, and just keep this in mind as we go into the service today because this is uh, the change of values in someone's life we're going to talk about today. The change of values that takes place as a, as a result of choosing to follow the Lord. Sorry, backing up a little bit. I didn't get it written down fast enough. On verse 2. Yeah. The, um, verse 2? Yeah. Okay. So what was that to be the testimony for? Testimony that... Oh, that, that God could handle his problem. The problem was he had to find dad's donkey. That was a problem. Saul realized that God could do that without his help. So I, reading this this morning, I didn't see anywhere where it said Kish and Saul's family were godly people necessarily. They probably it weren't. mention anything that... They probably you know, weren't. You know, like, we, like we mentioned, I think, either last week or the, the week before, Saul... Uh, Annie's family probably didn't have that much of a regard, paid that much attention to spiritual things. See? Because what I mentioned, and, and I, I mentioned that after I had shared with you how, how close, how close of proximity Saul lived to Samuel. But he had never heard of Samuel. He'd never heard of Samuel. But, like I mentioned also, this servant had. Because remember, he brought it to, we learned last week, he brought it to Saul's attention that there was a man in, in the city close by where they were going who <coughs> told people stuff and it came true. So, Saul realized now that God's power could come upon him. However, as we'll see later on, Saul would become very self-sufficient and very rebellious. And God would, like we mentioned, God would take the anointing from him. Lost his kingdom, lost his power, and eventually lost his life. Now, verses 7 and 8. Samuel gives some instructions to Saul. And this is very important. Verses 7 and 8. And let it be when these signs come to pass or come to you that you do as the occasion demands. You do what's supposed to. This was, <coughs> this was a test for Saul. 
as well. To do what Samuel told him to do. See? And, and Samuel or Saul needed to be a good steward for the Lord, a good servant for the Lord. The scripture says it, it is first of all declared among servants that they be what? Found faithful. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for faithful people. He's not looking for somebody who's not going to be reliable. Reliable. He's not looking for somebody where you can say, he's a good worker, but he never shows up on time. But he doesn't do what he's told. But God, God wants a servant that can just do what he wants him to do. And that's what he declared of Saul. So notice what, what, uh, what Samuel says. Let it be when these times come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So he says, you need to go down to Gilgal. I'm going to come down there in a week. I want you to be patient. Okay, don't want you to do anything. And I think during, those, during that week, Saul just kind of reflected on what, what Samuel, you know, the, the, the events over the last several days. <clears throat> and the signs come to pass, pass, verse 9. So it was when he turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart. <coughs> and all those signs came to pass that day. And the changed Saul prophesies with the other prophets in verse 10. When they came there to the hill, the, when the prophets came there to the hill, or when he, when he came, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And what takes place? Well, surprise, surprise. Notice verse 11 and 12. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, the question here, is Saul also among the prophets? Uh, it's not a question of contempt. It's a question of surprise, expresses surprise at Saul's sudden change in character. I came to know the Lord in September 1962. And a short time later, I came back up here. I was in San Diego at the time. I came back here and began to, to one of the things that they had was a alumni basketball game or something. So I, I went to that and, and was talking to different ones and was given a testimony and everything. And word had already gotten around that I'd come to know the Lord. People had, were taking bets on how long it would last. <coughs> and I remember people saying, God, you have changed. You have changed. <coughs> You'll talk about that this morning. A changed life, a changed heart. <coughs> so Saul, <coughs> one of the few times he did this, verse 13, Saul, um, and when he had finished prophesying, he went up to the high place. So he goes to the high place, the place of worship, and he probably worshiped. Okay? And then after this experience with the prophets, Saul then goes home. Probably got involved back in the farming thing. And he probably did not discuss his having been anointed king even with his close relatives. Notice verses 14 to 16. Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servants, uh, where'd you go? And he, and he said, I went to look for the donkeys. And when we saw that they were nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me, please, what did Samuel, Samuel say to you? He said, 
So Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. And, and probably Samuel had told Saul, don't breathe a word. The biggest thing that, that your family needs to know is the donkeys have been found. And if you want to tell them that you came to see me, that's fine. They may find out anyway because they live close by. But he said, don't tell them anything else. Samuel had told him to wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. And so it was a time for Saul to sort out all the things that had happened to him since leaving home to look for his father's donkeys. What an experience. A perfect example for us that pay attention to what God wants us to do. And sometimes he interrupts us on our way to, to do something that's pure and noble and everything like that. He may interrupt us. I don't know how many times I've been interrupted and in stuff down through the years. Right? We have. And, and God will send us off in a different direction. But we just got to have I, I, the fellow who discipled me, I remember him telling me when he realized that God had called me into, into Christian ministry, he says, Tom, now don't, don't overload your schedule week to week in such a way that you don't have time for flexibility. Okay. And, and sometimes we get tired and weary. I remember when I worked at the auto parts store in Garberville and I was I had a couple jobs, at least a couple jobs at, at that time, and was pastor out at Shelter Cove, and I'd get in my car 6.30, 7 o'clock, and I'd be on the way home. And I'd say, Lord, I don't want anybody to die tonight. I don't want any problem when I get home. See? I don't feel like dealing with it. And sometimes we don't. But if God chooses to interrupt us then he'll also give us the strength to deal with the interruption you got that so in your Christian walk be flexible be flexible so God God loves people that are flexible he 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 loves people who can who can think and act on the fly I've flown so much by the seat of my pants that the seat of my pants in all my trousers are worn out. Because we just, Nancy says that. You're flying by the seat of your pants again, or I'll tell her, you know, babe, I'm just flying by the seat of my pants here, but, but what? She'll say, be flexible. So pastors got changed, changed lives. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in our church. And we continue to ask for wisdom and direction as we plow ahead in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.